So while making my latest video about seeing electrons with the naked eye, by dissolving lithium in ammonia solution and making these fantastic dendrites, I first came across dendrites growing in lithium ion batteries. And then I came across this and thought, bullshit. Nearly 40 years after he helped create a battery that would change the world, Goodenough and researchers at the University of Texas at Austin have announced they've invented a new battery that sounds too good to be true. And the new battery they've come up with is unlike anything anyone's ever seen before. Compared to current batteries, it can hold three to 10 times the charge, can be recharged in minutes instead of hours, and has a lifespan of over a thousand cycles, and doesn't go boom in your back pocket. And pray tell, what do I find in the comment section? Now I know what some of you will be thinking, the inventor here is the guy who invented the lithium ion battery. It was in the late 1970s when John Goodenough developed the first lithium ion batteries right here at the University of Oxford. Something that has touched the life of everyone watching this video. This was a guy who could realistically lay claim to having revolutionized electrical design for a generation. So how can I say that he's talking crap? Well, I'll tell you something else. I know very little about batteries but I'm still gonna demonstrate to you why he's talking crap. Because I do understand thermodynamics and thermodynamics is king. So if for instance, I were to ask you, which contains more energy, a kilogram of body fat or a kilogram of TNT? Which would you say? Well, this is called energy density and it's gonna be crucial throughout this video. And as it turns out, body fat rules supreme. A kilogram of body fat contains almost 10 times the energy of a kilogram of TNT. Now, sure, it doesn't detonate quite as well, but it stores a lot of energy. In fact, from this, you can see that oil or body fat, gas, diesel, whatever, all contain a comparable amount of energy, which for a chemist is remarkably unsurprising as they all basically have the same chemical constitution. Now, currently, batteries hold about one-tenth of the energy density of TNT, which, as we will see, is a good thing because you're effectively trading energy density for safety. In fact, even from here alone, it must be painfully obvious that batteries are just a pale shadow of the energy density of things like gas. And there's a very good reason why gas is the fuel of choice of almost everything that needs lots of portable power because of kilowatts per kilogram. Now, batteries currently carry about one hundredth of the energy density of gas per kilogram. Now, let's just imagine for a second you could pack as much energy into your battery as TNT. Yeah, your battery contains quite literally as much energy as a bomb. But I hear you say, that's got to be an unfair comparison. I mean, because doesn't that mean that gas is even more dangerous than TNT? Well, in energy density terms, yes. However, gas only burns when it's mixed with air, which is a kind of built-in safety feature. And when you do mix gas with air, yes, those are the largest non-nuclear munitions on Earth. And the key reason for that is that gas contains about 10 times the energy density of TNT. So the father of all bombs, whose mm, credibility has been questioned, nonetheless, it's essentially a giant tanker truck with a burster charge in it. And all that burster charge does is it nebulizes the gas into the air which is then ignited and that's what releases all of the energy and causes the explosion. Now some of you might cry foul at this point because batteries generate electricity whilst burning fuel just generates heat. Well fine so let's see how much electricity we could generate for say a litre more or less a kilogram of gas if we were to burn it in a generator and we would get about three kilowatt hours which is about 10 megajoules for our liter, our kilogram of gas, which is still almost 20 times the electrical energy that you would get from a kilogram of batteries. In fact, at this point, I got to kind of correct wiki again, although this time it's in a more subtle fashion. Gas actually has zero energy density. It's only when it's chemically reacted with oxygen, when it's burned, that it has energy density. That's when it releases the energy. So in reality, it should be the energy density for the fuel plus 
the oxygen. Well, how much oxygen do you need to burn gas? Well, the Saturn V ran on essentially gas, mm, kerosene to be exact, and oxygen. I mean, like I was saying earlier, it really doesn't matter whether you're talking gas, kerosene, body fat, whatever. They all basically have the same chemical constitution. So the Saturn V burned kerosene and liquid oxygen. And seeing as they're both liquids with comparable densities, all you have to do is basically compare the fuel tank size for the kerosene tank and for the oxygen tank. And give or take, it's about two parts oxygen burn one part kerosene. And give or take, by volume or mass, doesn't really matter which, one kilogram of gas requires about two kilograms of oxygen to burn it. And yet these were liquid fuels, but it really doesn't matter. A kilogram of gas weighs exactly the same as a kilogram of liquid. The practical upshot of this is really, that should be the energy density of one kilogram of gas and two kilograms of oxygen. Now, of course, if you're getting the oxygen to burn the fuel from the air, then that's great because you don't have to carry that mass with you, which is basically how cars and jet engines work. However, if you're in space, say, for instance, you absolutely need to carry that oxygen with you. And in that case, the energy density is one kilogram of fuel and two kilograms of oxygen gives about 50 megajoules per kilogram. In other words, its true energy density is about one third of this. So it's about 15 megajoules per kilogram, which is now only about three times the energy density of TNT. And make no mistake, if you get a mixture of two kilograms of oxygen and one kilogram of fuel like this and mix them, that is still pretty much the apex of energy density. It's the apex of what can be achieved in terms of energy density from chemical fuel. And it's only safe when the propellants are stored in two different tanks. You mix those two propellants and give it the tiniest of ignition sources. And it will become very clear why having that much energy density packed into one structure has its drawbacks. So the oxygen fuel system has an energy density of about 15 megajoules per kilogram. And that's maybe a fairer comparison with TNT, where all of the energy of the TNT is packed into the structure of the material. And that's exactly what happens with a battery. You're storing all of that electrical energy within the structure of the battery in one way, shape, or form. Now, currently, batteries have about one-tenth of the energy density of TNT. Because they're metal, they can form little wires internally inside of the battery that can short circuit the battery. This can lead to significant safety concerns, such as formation of fires, etc. Now imagine you ramp it up by a factor of 10. You're quite literally in boomtown energy densities. Compared to current batteries, it can hold three to 10 times the charge, can be recharged in minutes instead of hours, and has a lifespan of over a thousand cycles. And I'll tell you why. Imagine you just short circuit the battery and you dump all of the energy from that battery. How much does the temperature of the battery increase? Well, let's make a first degree approximation that the battery has the same heat capacity as water, which is a very generous assumption given that water has a very high heat capacity. It takes about 4,000 joules to heat up a kilogram of water by one degree. So if our kilogram battery releases some 4 million joules, which is about the same energy density as a kilogram of TNT, the water would heat up to about 1,000 degrees, basically to white hot. Well, let's take another benchmark. Thermite has about the same energy density as TNT. And when that releases all of its energy, when it reacts, its temperature goes up over 2,000 degrees. Once it's going, there isn't a chance in hell of stopping it. PCV burns well. Although it should be said that thermite still contains one tenth of the energy of jet fuel. Um, you know, metal beams and all that. And this is the critical fundamental limit for batteries. All of that energy has to be locked up within the structure. And there's not many atoms you can actually lock that energy up in. And very much like with an explosive, 
If you get a failure in any one part of it, it can cascade through the entire structure, causing a cascade runaway failure, which leads to the destruction of the whole battery. Now, sure, you can actually get more powerful explosives than TNT. The problem is that as you get more energy into the structure, they become progressively less stable until you get to what is basically the apex of energy density, which is a mixture of liquid oxygen and gas, which given the slightest ignition source or someone just looks at it funny, will explode. So TNT really is pretty much the best that can be done in terms of stable energy storage, where you're packing all of the energy into a single structure. However, with a battery, you can't get anywhere near that because every molecule in the TNT is actually storing energy. You can't do that with a battery because you need at least one atom to hold the charge, one atom to take the charge when it discharges, and you need to separate the two by something you know, to stop it discharging immediately. Then, of course, you don't just want to get energy out of the system. You want to get electrical energy out of the system, which carries penalties of its own. The practical upshot of which is you'll be doing very well to get one tenth of the energy storage of TNT into a battery, which is about where the current battery technology is at the moment, which is actually very respectable. So basically, systems like gas have this inbuilt safety system in that it only becomes an energy rich material when you mix the oxygen and the gas together. This is why gas is basically a perfect fuel. It's an unbelievably safe system. There are over a billion cars that run on this at the moment. And even when idiots manage to set fire to their cars, this is just a tiny, tiny fraction of the energy safely stored in the gas tank. The fuel in that gas tank has enough energy to move the car some 500 or so miles, while electric car batteries will take up three or four times as much space as the fuel tank and the weight of the fuel tank and contain only enough energy to move the car about a third of the range of a gas car. Now, the downside of this, of course, is gas cars produce carbon dioxide, which in practical terms means that every year I've been alive has been one of the hottest top 20 years on record. Nonetheless, the gas tanks are incredibly safe because they cannot catch fire or burn until they're mixed with oxygen. And if you have a fire, all you've got to do is remove the oxygen and the fire goes out. Remove the oxygen from a battery fire on the other hand, and it will continue to release energy. The $70,000 car then burst into flames. Firefighters had a bit of trouble putting it out. They had to flip the car on its side, then used a circular saw to cut into the battery housing and douse the flames. This is exactly the sort of battery that would make an electric car a true replacement for a gasoline powered one. Spray water on it as if it's a sodium battery like good enough is proposing. It can be cheaper to make since it works with low cost sodium as well as lithium. That may be even worse. The water is 25 degrees. Okay? Yeah. And just so we're clear on how violent and erratic this explosion can be, this was merely 350 milligrams of sodium. That's only about the size of an aspirin tablet. This time you missed the take. Uh, uh, yeah, I missed the take with both. Uh, normally we have this one and a little high speed camera going, but that is all that's left of our comical flask. That was only 350 milligrams as well. As for good enough, no. He's not going to beat the laws of thermodynamics, which incidentally is something else the battery claims it does. He claims that the sodium metal is going to be on both electrodes, which in thermodynamics terms means there is no change in energy from moving the sodium from one electrode to the other. The battery cannot work. So the fact that this battery even works is confusing other top battery experts. It seems to be generating something from nothing, which is a big no-no according to the laws of thermodynamics. But according to Good Enough, it doesn't just work, it works spectacularly well. Now he claims it's some weird quantum thing because the layers of metal are so thin. Well, maybe if it was one or two atoms thick. 
And how thick is the metal on the electrodes? Well, according to him, a micron or so. That's one or two million atoms thick, rather than just one or two, which blows the whole Fermi energy thing out of the water. Look, I'm not saying there's no place for electric cars. Clearly there is. It just needs to be in the right venue. And I'm not saying that battery research is pointless, but you've got to be realistic about what can be achieved and what the drawbacks of cramming insane amounts of energy into a battery are. And honestly, I think we're pretty close to what can be achieved safely. We have, if you like, discovered the battery equivalent of gasoline, something that's not changed for, for an awful long time. And I really do wish that folks would just rein in the hype and just think about these things a little more skeptically. Many thanks to all those who support this channel through Patreon. And if you'd like to join those who support competent, scientifically literate media like this, you'll find the links below.